Alright, so this is a suggestion via a channel member. The name of the video is uh, Conspiracy Theories That Turned Out to Be True. Uh, this is coming from the channel Chilling Scares. Let's go and jump into it. Missing Japanese Citizens One night in June 1978, a 22-year-old single mother of two kids named Yaiko Taguchi was working her usual shift in Tokyo, Japan's Kaberet Hollywood. After finishing her shift right at around midnight, Yanko left the cabaret through the front door and was never seen again. Okay. At first, nobody thought that anything serious had happened to Yanko. In fact, several years later her manager was questioned and he claims that everyone thought she had quit when she failed to show up. At around that time, there had been rumors going around that several North Korean spies were working undercover in Japan looking to abduct innocent citizens and hold them as hostages back in oh, North no. Korea. However, this was seen by the Japanese government as nothing more than a conspiracy theory that couldn't possibly be okay, true. Okay, and it turns out apparently that most likely this young lady here was taken by these spies. Sadly, the missing case of Yaiko went cold, and it wasn't until almost a decade later that a clue to her whereabouts emerged following a disturbing chain of events. In November 1987, as South Korea was preparing to host the Olympics in the capital city of Seoul, a Korean Airlines plane blew up in mid-air as it was flying over the Andaman Sea, taking the lives of 115 innocent people. During the investigation, it was revealed that two North Korean agents acting under direct orders from the North Korean government had planted a bomb in an overhead storage compartment before getting off at the first layover in Abu Dhabi. As the authorities were closing in on the two suspects, one of them took his life with a cyanide-laced cigarette, but the South Korean government was able to arrest the other agent responsible for the attack. During her interrogation, it was revealed that she had been training for that mission for six years, and that for three of them she had been paired with Yaiko Taguchi, who had but why, why is her mouth covered? taught her how to speak and act like a Japanese woman so she could fly under the radar. As it was later revealed, Yaiko wasn't the only woman who had been kidnapped by the North Korean government. As of today, 17 Japanese citizens have been officially confirmed by the Japanese government as having been abducted by North Korea from 1977 to 1983. Disturbingly, a lot of them were shamelessly kidnapped in the middle of the day and thrown on a boat to North Korea. You might think that the victims were involved in something shady that put them on the North Korean government's radar, but the investigations actually suggest that most of them were average citizens who just happened to be at the wrong place at the wrong time. One woman was captured while she was walking to a knitting class, and two others were kidnapped on a vacation to Europe. Another one, a 13-year-old girl, was taken as she was walking back home from school. Some of these victims were kidnapped for identity theft purposes, while others, like Yaiko, were forcefully brought to North Korea to teach the Japanese language and culture to North Korean spies. Like a culture interpreter. After the kidnappings were confirmed beyond the shadow of a doubt, the North Korean government had no choice but to come forward and apologize. But they claimed that only five of the 17 kidnapping victims were still alive. Over okay, so did you return them? I mean, you could apologize and, and, and you know... Return them? That'd be great. For the next few years, the North Korean government pay some type of reparations for the uh, for the actions uh, that you've done here, guys. Government would send what they would claim to be the cremated remains of some of the deceased victims back to Japan. Wowzers. However, as DNA testing would quickly reveal, pretty that much all, all of the remains nonsense. were fake, leading the Japanese government to believe that many more of the kidnapping victims were, were still alive. alive. To this day, the North Korean government has stuck to its story, claiming that there are only 13 kidnapping victims and that the ones who are still alive were sent back safely to Japan. Shockingly, while the Japanese government has officially confirmed 17 kidnappings, the list of potential victims suggests that the true number could be as high as Much 800. Higher. Sadly, given the current political situation, it's unlikely we'll ever see the full extent of these abductions or yeah, see no. the North Korean government held truly uh, accountable for its horrific crimes. No one's going to hold them accountable, guys. And that's the unfortunate part, guys. I mean, sanctions work to a certain extent, but really what can seriously be done? Uh, nothing at all will actually give any type of justice uh, to the people and families that were destroyed by this uh, campaign. Just the other day, I found myself wasting hours of time I could have spent working on videos trying to find and cancel active subscriptions. That's why I've partnered with Rocket Money, the sponsor of this video. Rocket Money is the personal finance app that helps you cancel subscriptions, lower bills, uh, and manage your money code. better. The favorite feature of mine being canceling get okay, started so, for free. Okay. Guys, if you're interested in that that uh, that software, guys, for the program, um, there it goes rockbuy.com, uh, and, and this is his uh, channel name, guys. All right, free. Go jump forward. Heart attack gun. 
heart attack. Back in the 70s, a journalist named Seymour Hirsch published an article in the New York Times in which he accused the CIA of several assassination attempts on both foreign and American politicians who they considered to be anti-war dissidents. Due to these allegations, the U.S. Senate put the CIA under investigation for alleged covert action abuses, which resulted in the release of 14 reports on major abuses committed by the CIA, FBI, and NSA. The majority of the reports included accusations of crimes such as opening and resealing U.S. citizens' private mail for several years and illegally surveilling black power activists. Although these claims are obviously pretty serious, they paled in comparison to one particular accusation or conspiracy theory which alleged that the CIA had developed a pistol that could fire a poison dart over 300 feet, take a person's life, and leave absolutely no trace as to the cause of death. As it was later revealed- I mean, other than obviously the puncture, I mean, um, if you're gonna shoot some type of dart gun, let's say, uh, it's going to have to have most likely a point uh, if you're going to be injecting someone with uh, said illicit right, material. Uh, there would definitely be some type of proof of that. Uh, pretty sure coroners look for um, you know, abrasions and, and punctures and things like that all day long. This theory turned out to be true, and the development of the poison dart gun was just one part of the program called MK Naomi, through which the Naomi. CIA had sought to develop weapons for biological warfare. In 1975, William Colby, the CIA director at the time, had to testify in front of the committee that was investigating the agency. During questioning, he claimed that the CIA had developed a host of biological weapons as part of a plan to eliminate German leaders during World War II, but that their research had continued until well after the war. He also mentioned that the poison dart gun was almost completely silent on account of the battery that was housed inside the handle, and that battery. it had been specifically designed for the target to feel nothing more than a mosquito bite when the dart struck. Interestingly, so the agency nothing. had used a specific shellfish toxin to make it impossible for anyone to know what the cause of death was, leading forensic pathologists to believe that the victim had suffered an inexplicable heart attack. It wouldn't help pathologists that the oh dart was designed God. to melt inside the body so that it only left a small red mark where it entered the victim. When asked if the heart attack gun, as it was nicknamed, was ever used on anyone, the director alleged that it had only been used for experiments and that there were no records of actual use. Guys. As part of the investigation, the CIA had to hand over the gun to the committee, and there are some pretty wild pictures of the committee members analyzing the gun as William Colby answers their questions about it. So, so you mean like one singular gun? Like you, you really think that uh, this organization created one of them and said, you know what, that's okay, we'll go ahead and give it to you. Hopefully you guys were not silly enough to believe that that was actually the case, guys. Normally you'd expect to see something like the this heart attack gun in the spy possible. movie, and it's highly pretty wild possible. to think that if they hadn't put it under investigation, they would have probably gotten away with using it for who knows what purpose is. Guys. It's also pretty crazy to think that if that's the kind of stuff they were developing back in the 70s, mm -hmm. imagine the kind of technology they have their hands they on have now. right now. Disturbingly, right. the hearing was the only time the heart attack gun was ever shown publicly, and to this day it remains unclear what happened to it after the investigation. Oh, it went back into use. <laughs> Guys, Rogue come on. Waves. I'm not trying to be that guy here, right? I'm not trying to be him. Okay. I would love to believe that that's not a thing, but with how South America, let me, let me not get into that, with how, with how certain countries look, right, um, and all the, the things that we have done within these countries, guys, um, I am absolutely not positive. I'm not positive, guys. Um, <laughs> that, 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 that thing is still not in use or something better. Probably delivery by drone or something. Sailors often get a reputation for making up stuff they claim to have seen during their time out at sea. And because there's no one there to refute their claims, they right, sometimes so get away with nonsense. some pretty tall tales. For okay. centuries, sailors all around the world had talked about seeing monster waves on the open sea that would allegedly reach over a hundred feet in height. Plausible. In 1826, a French captain claimed that he had seen a 108 foot tall wave in the Indian Ocean. Even though he had three sailors with him who backed up his claims, when he came back to the mainland, he was publicly ridiculed by the scientific community, as it was widely believed that it was impossible for a wave to be higher than 30 feet tall. And guys, keep in mind, a lot of these old sailors, like, I mean, like, a couple hundred years old, a lot of them lied to specifically make sure that their patrons uh, would continue to fund their next, let's say, uh, sea exploit, right? Uh, for a pretty long time, South America, um, the tip of South America, the, the, the southern part, um, they said that there were giants there for a really, really long time. There were literal giants. 
And um, they were funding a lot of programs, let's say, uh, journeys, expeditions to places like that. So does it surprise me that sailors specifically would be making up a lot of things that are you know, happening that are not really happening? Doesn't surprise me at all. They they want to be on the sea. They have to uh, have someone to pay for it. For a long while after that, dozens of people continued to claim sightings of these monstrous waves in the middle of the ocean. But with no real evidence other than eyewitness testimonies, the existence of these waves fell into the urban legend or conspiracy theory category. In the 80s and early 90s, the Dropner platform was set up in the North Sea off the coast of Norway Dropner. to extract natural gas. As part of the protocol that was carried out to see if the platform was stable enough to withstand the rough seas, a wave height recorder was installed on the platform. On New Year's Day in 1995, the sensor recorded an 84-foot tall wave, which served as the first real piece of evidence for the existence of rogue waves. After this incident, a lot of people started wondering how many of the sailors from previous centuries had been telling the truth. Yeah, in What's terms more of disturbing waves, than that is that there were probably it. hundreds of disappeared sailors from all around the world who had come across a rogue wave, also known as a monster wave or a freak wave. But because most people who encountered 100 foot tall rogue waves generally didn't live to tell the tale, their testimony was went down into the depths me. of the ocean with them. Since the Dropner wave of 1995, there's been a growing interest in rogue waves brewing in the scientific community. A few years ago, a professor at the Australian National University had estimated that at any given moment, there are 10 rogue waves active in the world's oceans. As of today, a rogue wave is usually defined as a wave that is twice as large as the largest waves that come up in a particular area. Okay. And while the root cause of rogue waves continues to be investigated, it's generally accepted that these monster waves appear when two wave crests join together at the exact right time, resulting in a massive wave that can sink even the largest ships and oil rigs. Interestingly, it's also been discovered that rogue waves can take place in large lakes. In 1975, lakes? a freighter named the SS Edmund Fitzgerald sank in Lake Superior under some pretty mysterious circumstances, with a lot of people in the scientific community coming up with all kinds of hypotheses to explain the incident. It wasn't until several years later that the scientists started theorizing that the vessel could have fallen prey to a set of three consecutive killer rogue waves. A phenomenon referred to as the Three Sisters, in which the first wave destabilizes the ship, the second wave hits the ship's deck before it can stabilize again, and then the third, and the third annihilates. wave overloads the ship with more water than it can take on. If this were true, it could also provide an explanation for the mysterious sinking of other large ships in oceans around the world over the past few centuries, mm. but this might be a bit more difficult to prove. Right. Yeah, guys, I can definitely tell you this right now. My overall opinion based off of this is um, when it comes to, like, waves and things like that, guys, yeah, I believe it. All right. Like, for a really long time, we did not believe the sailors when they said, hey, listen, that's a giant octopus or, or squid or something. Like, that's a giant squid. That can't be a real thing. Then we find out that, uh, yeah, we have giant squids, guys. Right? Um, so I believe, a, I believe, no, no, no. I would say I'm probably 35% in on believing it. Like, as long as it can be somewhat logical, I'll probably back it, right? Um, but if you start talking about giants, guys, I'm going to pass. I'm going to pass on that one. I'm not going to help fund your trip, bro. Poisonous alcohol. In January 1920, the 18th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution was successfully ratified, triggering a 13-year period known as Prohibition, right. during which the production, sale, and transportation of alcohol was made illegal. During this period, the government enforced some pretty strict measures to prevent bootlegging of alcohol, which made the alcohol black market flourish like yeah. crazy. Right. It was pretty much a playground for the mafia, in which the government would raid one bar and another one would crop up in just a few days' time. While all of this was happening, there were some pretty messed up rumors floating around that the U.S. government was taking extreme measures to make sure people weren't consuming alcohol. These included allegations that the government was intentionally poisoning alcohol to make people who consumed it sick. For a while, this remained something of a concern. Guys, I'm going to be honest. That's pretty plausible. I mean, if you look at what the government has been doing for the longest time, uh, this would make all the sense of the world that they're doing something like this, bro. I'm going to be honest. Completely. I believe it. Like, if you would have said this, I would have said, you know what? I can imagine. Why? Because uh, if there are 100 barrels of whatever you're drinking or consuming, yeah, uh, and we just go ahead and do something nefarious to two of them, okay, and then we tell people, hey, listen, there is a chance that you're going to get really, really sick one day, right? Hint, hint, right? Um, yeah. And then, then out of nowhere, a couple of people in a, in a small town get really sick. That's the reason. Right? They're doing it to 
kind of make you stop doing something that they don't want you to do in the first place, guys. Even though uh, the majority of the people who passed that laws, right, were most likely still consuming the spirits at, uh, you know, copious amounts, guys. Conspiracy theory, but things took a turn pretty quickly on New Year's Day, 1927, when 41 people died from alcohol poisoning at New York's Bellevue Hospital. Disturbingly, Bellevue. the autopsies revealed that a lot of the victims had been drinking industrial methanol, otherwise known as wood alcohol, which can be fatal even at low doses. It turns out that the government had forced companies to denature industrial alcohol to make it undrinkable since 1906, which was far before prohibition. But when the crackdown on alcohol started, the government ordered these companies to add quinine, methyl alcohol, and other- Bro, were you just breaking these bottles all into like the, the public street? For- you do realize that now there's glass all over the public street. I mean, I guess they, they just didn't care back then. I don't know what it was like in the in the 1700s. I'm, I'm joking, guys, obviously. Toxic chemicals to it looks like the 1700s. Their reasoning was that Early if black market dealers knew their alcohol had been poisoned, they wouldn't dare distribute it knowing how dangerous it would be for their customers to consume. They didn't care about that. Why would they care about that? Uh, it's it's like you asking the people who, uh, who, who push poison to their communities, right? Like narcotic dealers. Like, do you really think that do you think that they care? No, they care about the money exclusively. Uh, they they do not seriously care about their client base. Uh, if they did, they wouldn't do that in the first place. Uh, so I would expect most likely bootleggers were probably in the same like mental state. I guess they forgot to factor in that the demand for alcohol at the time was absolutely insane and that black market dealers didn't care who lived or died from consuming their product. It wasn't until December 1933, six years after the Bellevue incident, that the federal government finally toned down their abstinence from alcohol policies. But by then, thousands of Americans had already been poisoned with contaminated alcohol. Gorillas. Gorillas. Nowadays, there's really nothing too shocking about seeing a gorilla in a zoo or on TV. But there no. was once a time when gorillas were considered to be in the same category as the Chupacabra, the Jersey Devil, Bigfoot, and the Loch Ness Monster. I was able to find that up until a couple of centuries ago, gorillas were considered cryptids, which are animals that are believed okay, by some to really? exist somewhere in the wild, but whose existence has never been proven. What was her name? With most of these them? creatures, alleged sightings often turn out to be hoaxes, but obviously in the case of gorillas, what were once just rumors turned out to be true. Western explorers wouldn't come across a gorilla until around the 1500s, when an English explorer named Andrew Battelle was captured by the Portuguese off the coast of West Africa. While he was held captive on the mainland, Battelle described these disturbing, giant, ape-like creatures that would occasionally prowl around his campfire, but because he had never seen a similar creature before, he described them more as monsters than as animals. Battelle's description sent the rest of the world into what we can only call a gorilla frenzy, with all kinds of rumors being spread about these allegedly bloodthirsty, dangerous creatures living in exotic parts of the world. Dangerous? Absolutely. Over the next couple hundred years, Plus, the buzz around know. gorillas nah. grew as explorers in Africa sent back illustrations of gorillas to Europe, which were often given to royalty and emperors as rare gifts. Okay. If you were to ask any European back then what a gorilla was, they would have described it in a similar way to how we describe Bigfoot or the Chupacabra nowadays. They were thought of more as mythical monsters than regular animals. It wasn't until over 200 years or so later that an American naturalist named Thomas S. Savage found a gorilla skull in 1847 during an expedition to Africa, which was the first piece of real proof for the existence of these animals. Naturally, this triggered a bunch of- You, you do know when you say Africa, it, it matters um, <laughs> where in Africa, right? Because that's like saying North America. Where in North America? Of new expeditions to the area, and between 1855 and 1859, French explorer Paul Duchenne confirmed the existence of gorillas and even brought some back a dead. Just as Andrew Battelle before him, Paul Duchenne also described gorillas as these savage, bloodthirsty creatures, which stuck in the public mind for a long time. Okay. Around 15 years later, some German explorers brought back a baby gorilla from Africa to Liverpool, even putting up some towels on the ship so he could swing around and entertain himself on the long journey back. As you can probably imagine, as soon as the ship arrived back in Liverpool, people started flocking around the hotel where the gorilla was allegedly being kept to catch a glimpse of the once mythical creature. To the public's dismay, Pongo the gorilla wasn't the massive, violent monster they had thought, but rather a cute little two-year-old gorilla who loved to play with dogs. 
A few years later in 1902, a German explorer named Robert von Beringe killed two mountain gorillas, which were huge in comparison to the baby gorilla that the previous German explorers had brought back. I'm not gonna lie bro, that mustache needs to go. You need to go ahead and let that go. Immediately. And that was really the first time the public was able to understand what a full-sized adult gorilla looked like. It's pretty crazy to think that at some point these animals that we now see as normal were once seen as legendary monsters. Interestingly, if you really look at the research, there are a ton of other animals that we now take for granted that were once brushed off as hoaxes, including kangaroos, platypuses, giant squids, and Komodo dragons. Mm. With so like the, the giant squid, guys. So many of these myths turning out to be true, it really makes you wonder how many animals are out there that we have no idea even exist. Not many. Like, I think we are at the point where um, we've pretty much seen everything. There's really not much left on Earth that um, is probably going to surprise, you know, people en masse. I don't really think so. Um, like, there are no real places that we haven't gone, um, you know, like that. Maybe Antarctica, potentially. Right? I'm sure there's some things in, Antar in, in Antarctica that would be incredibly intriguing to encounter, right? Uh, maybe there's a entrance, right? to the inside of the earth. Maybe there's like, I mean, I've seen a lot of crazy videos by Antarctica guys. Um, I do think that that's probably going to be the last frontier. I mean, there are some places obviously in like the Amazon and things like that, that are incredibly intriguing. I mean, um, you know, groups of people that have just been completely uh, withdrawn from, you know, modern human society, uh, Sentinel Island and um, some of the tribes in the Amazon, right? I mean, other than that, I'm not really sure there's anything left to really discover, unfortunately. Um, but all right, guys, tell me which one of these uh, stood out to you the most. I mean, personally, the uh, the concept of the heart attack gun, that's an intriguing one, guys. I don't know what that is, right? And I also don't believe um, that they stopped using it, okay? Um, I don't want to call myself a theorist here in this instance, but um, I don't believe it. Not our government. That's a no. They probably just, just made it better. Enhanced it. That was the 70s? Bro, that was like a thousand years ago. What do you mean? But all right, listen, guys, you guys all have an absolutely amazing day. Enjoy your day thoroughly. This is my, my lightsaber. Hey, guys, you guys subscribe to the other channels, Logical Movie Reviews with Mr. L. Boyd, along with Mr. L. Boyd Music. Oh, also, Mr. L. Boyd Discusses. Guys, check it out. And if you haven't heard it today, amazing.